My name is Ann Smith, and we're here for Africans United of New England. And today, my guest is Simon Hamada Maingi. Hamada Maingi. Oh, I said it wrong. So Hamana. No, I'm glad you told me. So, so my legal name is actually Kaluzitu Hamani Maingi. But due to the fact that like people can pronounce my name, Kalazitu. I guess, yeah, yep, I can see right. that. That, <laughs> yeah, but that would be a while for me to catch that. Yeah, I'll, 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 friends. I'll yeah. just tell people like you know, imagine being like six years old and like you know in school trying to write a thirteen letter name and everybody has like Joe, Kim, you know, <laughs> this and that. So it's just like you know, so very. Right. But Simon is, is, is definitely an okay name, Simon. Okay, great. Well, Simon is here because. Um, uh, you know, when Bazia and I have given our sh the, given the show, we've talked a lot about the uh, first generation of um, new arrivals from Africa and other parts of the world, uh, the sort of millennial generation, and the things that they're up against. There are a huge number of them um, from Africa as well as the Middle East, and as everybody in the United States knows, we're probably going to get a whole bunch of Afghanis yeah. and other people. And, and making your way to a place of comfort, uh, where, and, you know, where you don't feel like a complete and total stranger to everything, and a place where you feel like you're starting to succeed is is tough. Is tough. There's a there's a lot of a um, lot of things you have to navigate. So we're going to start by asking Simon um, to tell a little bit about his birth and how his family ended up being uh, uh, traveling from place to place or moving quite a lot yeah. uh, 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 through, again, of course, no fault of their own. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about that and then uh, how they arrived in the United States. So Simon, why don't you tell me where you were born? and. Uh, so again, my name is Keluzitu Hamani Muyingi. Um, I was born March 11, 1995. Uh, my mom was from Congo, my dad is from Angola, and I was born in Ethiopia along with my sister, Segunda. And your family, you were born in, where were you born? Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. You were born in Addis Ababa. So yeah. both of your parents were, were from two different countries, but yeah. you ended up in, in Addis Ababa. Were you in a camp to begin with, or were you living there? Well, actually, we were very blessed and fortunate to kind of avoid, you know, that kind of um, scenario where uh, my family originally, their original goal was to go to Sweden. Um, their main goal was just to stop by Ethiopia, have one of my, uh, my dad uncle, you know, take care of paperwork for my dad to go to Sweden first. And then you know, send my send me and my mom along. But at the time, my my my, my dad found out that you know my mom was pregnant, so they just decided to just say you know let's stay in Ethiopia and you know, start a new life. And from okay. there, you know, my mom, you know, she sold clothes, and my dad was an entrepreneur. He sold goods. You know, he went to Sudan. Just I like to call him Indiana Jones. You know, yeah. they travel different parts of the world just you know just to kind of get seeking a the family fortune. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much just that. Yeah. Yeah, and your mom, what did she do? Uh, she she pretty much sold clothes, and she was very like even now thinking about it, she was very involved in like you know in the in the, in the uh, immigration you know community as okay. well the refugee community even like even looking at like her old pictures you know I seen her like holding mics you know doing a lot of activity just to promote women you know gather men you know women empowerment you know within the, okay. the immigrants. And you're the oldest of how many children? Uh, four. Four. Uh, you have a sister younger than you, yeah. and then a brother, and then a sister. So, so it's me, my sister. Another sister and ah, a younger brother, yeah. And your younger brother. Yep. Okay. Um, but you didn't get to go to Sweden. You stayed in, some, in uh, Ethiopia. Ethiopia, yep. And, and from there you went to? From there we went to. So it's a... It's, it's all right. It's, it's all right. No, <laughs> no it's a very good... Because it makes me stop because it, like, it's, it could have been... And we could have been anywhere in the world. We're actually here in America. And, and I think many of people like yourself who are new to this country can will nod and say, yeah, it took us all these different stops yep. to get where we wanted to go. And maybe we didn't even get there yet. Yeah. yeah. So go ahead. Tell, tell a so, little bit about the story of your long odyssey getting here. Yeah. So again, born in Ethiopia, stay there for 10 years. Um, originally, when we took care of the paperwork for us to you know, leave uh, Africa, we were supposed to originally go to Canada. Uh, we did the whole paperwork to pro we did the whole paperwork to go to Canada, and somewhere along that process, they changed our destination. They said, "Okay, you guys will be going to America," <laughs> and then we did the paperwork. They didn't we, ask. They yeah, just, they did just it. hey, you guys okay. are going to go to America, and you know, we did all the paperwork. You know, we sold all of our goods. We were ready to travel, 
And then when we, right when we got at the airport, they confirmed that we were going to Washington, D.C. to start our life there. Okay, and which then, sounded cool, I'm which, sure. You know, hey, Washington, D.C., you know, any, you know, African or anybody around the world, you know, we'll be happy to, to, to live, you know, in, in, in the area of White House, you know. Yeah. And um, when, when we got at the airport, they, they took my dad to a separate room, and we were kind of getting scared. And I was just getting, getting a little shaken up, like, hey, what's yeah, going on? Uh, not today, next year, or, you know, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they took my dad to a separate room, and then they pretty much told him that, hey, you know, um, sorry for all this change again. You guys will be going to Baltimore, Maryland. And then from there, everything was confirmed. You know, they did they think we spoke to, like, our caseworkers, you know, from you know, while they were in America and while we were, like, I think somewhere, like, in Germany on our way to America. And from there, you know, we started life, you know, in Baltimore, Maryland, 2005, summer of 05, and from there has been history. And I think you mentioned when we first talked about this that there was something kind of ironic about your ending up in Baltimore, that your father recognized the harbor when you... Oh, yeah, I do remember that story. So um, just before all these processes, be, you know, came in place about, you know, us wanting to leave out of um, Africa, um, one time my dad was just looking at a TV show, and then uh, it was actually the Baltimore Inner Harbor, and he didn't know, you know, what part the, of... The, yeah, because what, the harbor of Baltimore is, is a huge attraction, tourist yes, attraction. for sure, for sure, for sure. And then um, the reason I can see why he kind of connected with that, because he actually wanted to start his own, like, import-export business. And so uh, when he seen the harbor, you know, the boats, he kind of connected with it. And then I, he vividly told himself, like, I'm going to take my family there one day. And then <clears throat> after the whole entire process, you know, Sweden didn't work, you know, Canada didn't work, Washington DC didn't work. It was just like when we arrived in Baltimore City, we were just walking around the inner harbor and then just hit my dad's like, I wanted to bring my family here. So and there was a great deal of irony that he ended up a place he had already seen, didn't even know what it was. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, obviously he didn't even know it was called Baltimore. No, because not at all. <laughs> when, they, when they said Baltimore, he didn't know, but he saw the harbor and he went, whoa, this is home. Exactly. Uh, great feeling, great yeah. feeling. So at that point, you were what, 10, 11? Yeah, 10 going to 11. And uh, where did you get placed in school? So um, around the area, around the neighborhood we live at, they have uh, different schools called Highland Town. So they have like Highland Town 215, 237. I think they have like another one again as well too. So I started off going to school at Highland Town 215. Okay, and what grade did they put you in? Um, fifth. Okay, and uh, was it at this point no, I think it was later that you did your little trick, so I won't bring that up right now. Um, it, how did, I, I guess I'll ask, how did you go about fitting in? Well, so I was very blessed and fortunate, like, you know, as, as I stated earlier, my family was definitely a refugee in, you know, Ethiopia, thanks to you know, my mom and dad, you know, sewing, you know, selling goods, you and know. all their work, yeah. Yeah, all their work. You know, they were able to afford to send me and my sister to a private German school. So that's where I was able to, Oh, you know, okay. Pick so up by English. the time you came to the United States, you already spoke English. English. And what other languages? So I already spoke English, Lingala, French. I used to speak fluent Amharic. Fluent, like even when I Which spoke... Which is the language of, of Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Yeah. And um, even when I spoke with people back in Ethiopia, they wouldn't even think that, you know, I was from, you know, another country. Like, oh, no, you're actually one of us. And you speak so good, no accent. But actually, when I came here, right around that time, I didn't have nobody to practice it with. So I kind of lost it. But there's few, like, just a few years down the line, we figured there was a huge congregation of, like, Ethiopians in Washington, D.C. and Virginia. So I was like, oh, if we actually went to Washington, D.C., you know, I could have still kept It'll that come language. back, though. Yeah, There'll definitely. be the right opportunity will come up. For but sure. you already had a lot of English. But yeah. was it at this point you pulled your little trick so you'd fit in? I think you, you told me about yeah, this. Yeah, so I think it was, like, the like the first the first week of school, you know, um, I know, of course, of course, I watched a little bit, uh, watched a lot of TV back home in Africa, so I understand how the whole, you know, school system kind of work, how to fit in. So, one of my survival tactics was just not to speak English at all, because that's, you know, that's what they expect. You know, somebody who left back home, we came here, you know, you have to relearn everything. So, that, that first whole week, I didn't even speak English at all. So, I kind of gave me a chance to see, you know, who's the good person, who's the bad person, and it actually right. did work. So, you sort of went undercover. Yeah, sort of. No, said. I mean, really, you <laughs> did, in, in undercover linguistically, as someone who changed schools eight times yeah, before I graduated that. from high school. Yeah. Uh, I, I wish I'd learned that technique, because I couldn't have faked that I didn't speak English, but if I had learned maybe to keep my mouth shut <laughs> when I arrived in a new community, I might have been more prepared for who to make friends with, but mm -hmm. I always plunged in. Yeah. Um, so then you said, uh, you told me before that you ended up spending two years in the fifth grade. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, so fifth grade, Highland Town, um, 215, um, went to school there. And actually, um, 
it was another trick that also pulled as well too. We actually we also have Esau. So of course you know they give you the 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 the, the, um, the pre-exam. Um, well, okay. I didn't I didn't flunk it or any, anything, but I just did the best the best of my ability. Of course and, you, you did. Know, of course you did. And one of they just thought it was just a good idea just to be in ESL because you know there's like a lot of Latino kids. You know a lot of like right. you know, so it kind of so just it made, was a convenient placement. Yeah, yeah, it right. was a very convenient placement. So yeah, and then but then they ended up keeping you there a second year. Yes. And I think you said that had something to do with testing and possibly some mistakes. Yeah, so um, fifth grade went well. Um, sixth grade, you know, you know, first year was, you know, survival a little bit. Sixth grade, I started getting acclimated a little bit. Um, I was kind of just falling off a little bit in terms of grades and things of that nature. I think that was right around the time when uh, George W. Bush had that little uh, No Child Left Behind program. So thank God that came in, in, in good timing. But uh, yes, I was kind of like flunking out of our grades a little bit, uh, sixth grade. So, oh, I know that series of tests because yeah. I was teaching at that point. And they did yeah. say, oh, oh, why is he here? He, boom, mm -hmm. why is he here? Mm -hmm. So you got shot down because of the testing system. Yeah. And um, you didn't really think that was necessary, right? Well, yeah, you know, um, I hate to say, but like sometimes, you know, like I wish sometimes school system could really just show the importance of, you know, what tests like, you know, SATs, you know, now I fast forward actually being in high school, I have another story for that too, like things like such as SATs, you know, all those little test preps that, you know, we have that helps people, you know, get aligned to, you know, move forward with their education. I wish sometimes they could put more, you know, emphasis on that because um, with, with, I mean, with my situation, again, um, sixth grade, it was kind of a turbulent year for me in terms of grade, grade wise. And then um, right around the time that the No Child Left Behind program was there, it was just that, it was kind of like summertime. It was cool, like, it was like, just like two weeks before school was almost over. And I got in trouble that day, and I, I vividly remember that teacher. I'm not going to say her name. Um, that day, we were supposed to have a meeting with my parents to make to make that decision whether I should go to you know to seventh grade or you know stay behind. Ah, okay. And yeah, and then um, I was so afraid that day that I got in trouble that I didn't, I didn't even bring my mom to school. And then, so they just decided, okay, maybe he just wants to you know do the sixth grade all over again. Ah, so it was yeah. sixth grade you repeated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, I, and I've got a comment here, and because as a teacher, I've also talked to a lot of other teachers dealing with families from other countries. And, and, I, and I think it would be a good idea at some point if someone sat down with American teachers and explained to them that African parents treat school very differently. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I was a teacher for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. I found, toward, especially towards the end of my teaching career, that uh, parents were, American parents, were pretty casual. You know, if the teacher said, you know, little Emily did a lousy job this year, mm -hmm. they'd say, oh, well, that's the teacher's opinion. Yeah. Well, we think little Emily's just fine. Mm -hmm. And they would go to little Emily. Uh, and, and, and I wanted to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm, I've seen your child every day, every school day, mm -hmm. for a whole year, I've assessed her performance. I think little Emily needs some help with X, Y, or Z. Right. American parents don't accept that. Yeah. African parents, on the other hand, when I've talked to them, tend to almost overreact. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was. And I bet you were scared it, when it, you it, knew that they wanted to meet with your mother. Not even that. I mean, I mean, my parents were. were I mean, they weren't like, like. Rah, rah. They, they were very open and very understanding, but they still did. They still did put that great expectation on me to perform good in school, but. The school, you know, as me being an international kid, you know, they all they had that expectation of like, you know, he should already do do we should be doing good in school already. So like just just that whole like misfit where like, you know, like I'm kind of failing people somewhere, somehow really just put a little, you know, a guilt yeah. guilt within yeah. myself. But after that, um sixth grade, um, next school year came and again, I actually went there with like, you know, cause I like in, in, in that school system, like every grade they have different color shirts. Oh yeah, you yeah, told yeah. me about that. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like it was like um, yes, yeah, so it was like I guess I was expecting to go in the seventh grade because you know. So I, you had a seventh grade shirt. I had a seventh grade shirt in in the sixth grade, you know. <laughs> so first day of school, you know, everybody had their color shirt on. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm going to. The, I, I I bought like the, the the seventh grade school material, the books I needed, <laughs> and then I'm you walking. Were ready. <laughs> I was ready. I was like, I escaped that meeting. It is all good. <laughs> it's a new school year. Let's go. So I, I went there, and then the teacher was like, oh. No, you know, you weren't supposed to be in the seventh. You were supposed to be in sixth grade. I was like, what? <laughs> it was probably the most embarrassing like moment of my life as, as, as a young kid. You know, I'm like, you imagine just being in the among sixth grade. You know, you're like the only one with like a burgundy oh, shirt. Oh, Everybody. And that's, like, oh, I, I feel, I feel for you. I feel for you because I'm telling you, 
adolescence and, and sixth and seventh grade, you're approaching adolescence. Oh my God, they're so aware oh. of what other people mm -hmm. are thinking while they're thinking the worst of me and I just want to disappear. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you end up, however, in out of the out of the regular public school system in Baltimore. You told me you went to a charter school. Yeah, so um, that time, so uh, me and my sister did start school together at 215. She did. She attended there for one year and got transferred to a, a charter school, which was just like few, just like few minutes from where my school was. And then my sister was doing pretty good in school, you know. Like she's, always, she's always doing good in school, but like, you know, the teacher, the atmosphere was a bit different because, you know, sometimes my mom would pick me up from my school and mm -hmm. her school. She just like knew the atmosphere was a bit different. So she's like, you know what, now the fact that, you know, you're doing sixth grade all over again, you know, just to save yourself from that embarrassment. And why don't you go to a charter school? Exactly. And then when I went to that charter school, it was a, a total different ball game. You know, I yeah. made, you know, good friends. And it was just like, that was when I was actually living that, like, you know, elementary, middle school, American dream, if I should say, you know, uh, good teachers, you know, good friends. And the good thing mm -hmm. about that charter school was, you know, they were very small and very intimate. So like all those kids, they pretty much grew up together. Yeah. So it wasn't really hard fitting in, you yeah. know. Yeah, America America's starting to understand the value of charter schools. I don't know if you know that in Portland, there are basically three public high schools, and uh, there's very different atmospheres in oh, each yeah. one of them. Oh, yeah. uh, and uh, to me, the uh, um, Casco Bay is sort of like the charter school. It's, it's intended for the arts people with the arts and uh, musical, musical and all that in, ability. But uh, I've talked to kids who went there, and there's a... Um, I'm not saying the other schools are bad. They're no, not, not at all. But uh, Portland important. High is very conventional, and Deering has a focus on um, on the trades mm -hmm. and learning skills, which yeah. are, of course, very practical. Mm -hmm. But Casco Bay, and you can choose, by the way, in Portland, which one you want to go oh, to. Great. Well, it doesn't matter. They give you everybody a bus pass mm -hmm. uh, on, or on the regular transit system. So you, if you want to go to Casco Bay and you live on the other side in the West End, go for it. Um, but Casco Bay, I've talked to kids who went there, and there's an excitement that they felt mm. oh, uh, yeah. from the teachers. And I think, it, I think it's because they, certain atmospheres attract a certain kind of mm -hmm. teacher. Uh, I, I, and personally, I'm, I'm biased. I think the teachers make the schools. I think without good teachers, you don't have a good school. Oh, I can definitely relate to that. Um, so you finished high school, eventually, yep. and you went to college, yep. and you got a degree in? Business management. Business management. Um, any highlights along the way? Well, so just to kind of piggyback on what you said about, you know, kids picking pathway, actually, when I went to, you know, uh, the charter school, you know, all grades picked up pretty well and made great friends. And then um, I went to Digital Harbor High School. And then one of the thing about it, they had different pathways as well, too. You know, you can pick, you know, it was um, media, which I, 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 I picked. Um, it was media, network, um, I think it was like ISS. I think they, they, had, they had four different pathways. And out of those four, I definitely picked out, you know, media. Yeah. Okay, and your high school experience was a pretty good one. Oh, yeah, it was great. You know, played sports, you know, uh, MVP soccer, ran track. We had, like, the best, you know, sport program, you know, in the whole entire city and around the region as well, too. So, and, and then, you, then you went to college, mm -hmm. and um, at that point you were still in the Baltimore area? Yeah, so, um, again, um, our school had a very good sport program, and I was actually going for a scholarship. And, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of my people, a lot of the kids actually graduated where they went to Texas, you know, because we had a very good, you know, program and a lot of coaches, you know, will give us call. And, like, I wasn't really too sure to, like, you know, move across state, you know, go to Texas, all those, like, programs that wanted, you know, who wanted to recruit us. So I actually ended up just going to Howard, Howard Community College, which wasn't too far from home, you know, it was very close by. Was that in Baltimore? No, that's in, um, well, it, well, it's in Maryland, but Howard, Howard County. Oh, okay. Yeah, Howard County, okay. Yeah. Um, and you were at that point thinking along the lines of doing what with your life? Well, so again, um, high school was, really, I mean, anybody can attest to it. High school is really that, um, that, 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 that really shapes you, you know? That really gives you like an insight of who you want to be. And I, for me, I was kind of like a different kid, you know? Like I, I did a lot of researches, you know? I was just like, I was very friendly with a lot of people, but at the same time, it was just like, I was just thinking way ahead, way ahead of a lot of my peers and again, my high school, we had a very good, strong community of like international kids. That's one thing our school was well known for. So just kind of being around people, say, hey, you know, you should do entrepreneurship. You're very good with people. So just hearing those feedback and just knowing me who I am, I just went up pretty, you know, I'll just go ahead and just hone on to, you know, my people skill, my business, you know, sense, and, you know. 
Well, I'm going to sound like an old fogey, but I, I think if anybody listens to this show, or when they listen to this show, mm -hmm. they're going to look back at your parents and what they did, right. and the whole life you had leading up to arriving in the United States. Mm -hmm. And to me, your family was probably all involved in, in everything. Every time you said, oh, Sweden, oh, no, no, it's not Sweden, oh, Canada. But when those conversations were had, you're, they weren't had by your parents behind closed doors. No. They shared, With us. you know, so your family was close knit. Yep. And your parents were very supportive oh, yeah, of definitely. every single one of you. Mm -hmm. Any opportunity they had to get you more education, more opportunity, mm -hmm. they would take it. Yeah. Um, and those are enormous strengths. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, my family dy dy dynamic is very different. And I'm, I'm even glad you said that because, you know, regarding college and school, you know, right around that time when I actually graduated high school, um, I got introduced, you know, to a business, which I very felt very passionate about. You know, the mentorship was great. And right around that time, you know, people, especially like a lot of millennials can definitely relate. And it got to that point where, like, you know, it's still going on until today where, like, people are like, oh, I don't think I need, like, a college degree, you know, because a lot of people, you know, spend so much money on school and don't end up getting you know, into yeah. the profession that they this want. This is one so of like, the big, big splits in the path. Yeah, so I, I kind of did it. Well, I don't want to say I fell for that trap. It was like a good, it was like, it was a bittersweet kind of moment. I actually, I actually sat down with my family, with, with, uh, with, with, with my parents. I told them, I think for right now, I want to you know, give school a break. And I really want to focus on my business. And surprisingly, they, they supported you. They know? backed you. They, they, they backed me up. They say, you know, we support you. Um, just as long as you're happy, which I vividly remember. Now, that didn't work out, though. That, that, that plan, and we don't need to go as to where, where it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. But you also, <laughs> I think a mistake many people make, I know, I know in my family, mm -hmm. it, the belief was if it, isn't, if it hasn't got a guarantee written right across the top of it, oh, don't try it. Don't try it. Don't try it. Okay, now, I don't think your family was that way. Mm -hmm. You'd, your family as a group had been constantly engaged in taking chances and yeah. uh, I sometimes wish that my parents this sounds silly but I think it would have been nice if they had let some of us make a mistake once in a mm -hmm. while because really um, and there's three in my family we didn't learn to be able to bounce back from a catastrophe yeah. until we got out of the house yeah. because we never made any mistakes because our parents made sure we didn't make any mistakes mm -hmm. um, so <sighs> Your present career, um, so the source of your strengths would be, uh, you know, your family, yeah, your experience mm -hmm. with many different people. Oh, yes. I can yeah. vouch for that because I bounced around as a kid and you bounced around the world. <laughs> um, but then, then you now have a uh, career path that you're going on where you, you want to get, you want to just get things started. Yeah. Um, why don't you tell your audience what you do to make money, what your business is? So for right now, I'm currently, you know, a partner of African United. I'm actually the youth ambassador. Uh, we actually want to create a platform in the state of Maine where, you know, we want, you know, youth, you know, you know, from the age of eight until, you know, 30 to create a safe space where they can come, you know, discuss about, you know, home topics, you know, what's going on in the world and definitely, you know, provide them, you know, you know school opportunity, you know, work opportunity. And again, just creating that safe space, you know, for kids, you know, to come discuss about, you know, to, you know, just matters. And I, I like to tell, you know, my partner, Mr. Vazir, like, we want to be the GA of, you know, the teenagers and, and like, the young adults of, like, you know, Mainers. <coughs> well, you, when we were planning this interview, you, you said something I really liked. You said, you don't know what you don't know. Yep. And that this may be, uh, while everybody's in that situation, mm -hmm. when you're a refugee, it's much bigger. Yep. Because you're now in a country where the your closest people, your family and your siblings, are in the same position you are, yeah. you don't have anybody close by mm -hmm. to deal to turn to and say, "What do I do about this? What do I do about this?" <laughs> um, you can find people in the community you're living in, mm -hmm. agencies, um, but all too often, and you and I have also talked about this. Mm -hmm. All too often, some of the community services that are provided are there just to deal with maybe one specific problem or to tell you to go here for this mm -hmm. or there for that. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But when do you get the opportunity to sit down with other people like yourself yeah. in your approximate age group mm -hmm. and say, man, that was really tough yeah. or 
gee, I don't know if I can do this. Yeah. Because if you can do that in a room full of 10, 12, or more mm -hmm. of your peers, there's going to be somebody in that room who's going to have gone through the same thing yep. you're either looking at or thinking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm even glad you brought that up. Even one thing I forgot to mention also, like that's also, that's also got in the financial industry as well too, because I felt like a lot of people around my age group, you know, didn't want to take that, you know, traditional route again. They were looking for other platforms, you know, to generate income, not only generate income, but actually learn about, you know, how, you know, income works. Because at the end of the day, you know, in the United States of America, one of the most important thing you have to learn is how money works. Absolutely. How money yeah. works. I'm sorry to say sometimes I think it's God and money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you can't do much of anything in this country if you don't know how the whole money system works. Mm -hmm. And then that's part of it. You're, so you're an ambassador for Africans United, but at the same time, your your money-making mm -hmm. career plan involves financial, finance. Financial education. And, and in particular, you told me there's one thing you are trying to promote the use of, and that's insurance. Yes. Uh, and this is, would be, why? Why insurance? Well, just, you know, growing up, you know, again, from transitioning from high school, college, and just networking with different people, you know, insurance is everything, you know. This table, you know, depending on how much the value is, you know, it has insurance. Earring has insurance, you know, everything has insurance. But one of the most important topic, one of the most important thing is that even one of the, my main motivation I see moving here to Maine as well too, besides, you know, being a youth ambassador, uh, there's a huge congregation of like, you know, again, Congolese people, you know, you know South Sudan, you know, many people from, from different countries. But one thing that really hurts me the most is when people pass away, they pass around that golden bucket. And it wasn't until that one, and that's how she connected with the whole insurance uh, um, aspect of profession because it was that one moment where actually, because I'm very involved in like in the community stuff. So usually I'm like the youngest guy, you know, amongst adults talking about, you know, that's okay. pop policy and this and that. But it was that one moment that just shifted everything from me. It was this one individual, he passed away and they were having that same meeting to pass around that golden bucket. Well, let's stop here so that Americans listening to this can know what you mean. This is, this is a practice in, in, a, in an African community that doesn't happen in an American community very often. I mean, mm -hmm. when somebody passes away, friends and relatives may help, mm -hmm. but it would be unusual for the family to say, oh, we need $20,000 to bury Simon, okay? <laughs> Uh, everybody throw money in the hat. This yeah. happens in the African community yeah. every time someone dies, mm -hmm. primarily because the family wants to send the body where? Back home. Back home. They want that body buried in Congo. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. So families can't afford that. No. Not when the breadwinner's been uh, removed. Yeah. So, um, we're going to talk about this and other parts of the difficulty of being a refugee in our next program. Simon is going to be a guest again on my show. Thank you for having and, me again. And uh, we're going to also talk about, uh, we're going to talk possibly on that show, we're going to add some film clips of other people in his age bracket and how they've solved problems. So thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for having me again. Man,